Welcome to our introduction to sociology. We're basing this on the text for your course, The Real World, An Introduction to Sociology by Carrie Ferris and Jill Stein. We begin by looking at the fact that sociology is one of the social sciences, and that's a part of the group that looks at human or the social world. The social sciences are interested in understanding the social world in the same way that the natural sciences are interested in understanding the natural or physical world. Think about things such as geology or astronomy, or chemistry. Social scientists and natural scientists even use many of the same research techniques, including the scientific method. Social scientists employ many different kinds of research methods, and we'll learn about those later in this course. You'll also find that sociology overlaps with other social sciences, but there are also some things that are unique to sociology, and the territory that it covers can be quite unique. What is sociology? It's the study of society. If we use a definition from Howard Becker, that it's the study of people doing things together because neither the individual nor society exist independently of each other. We're social beings and without the contact of other people, we would not be the unique individuals that we are. One of the things that Becker did that became famous was that he studied the unwritten rules of jazz musicians that allow those musicians who've never met before to jump on stage and perform well together. Have you ever been told that you act like a relative? Hmm, think about it for a moment and then ponder whether that's a genetic link or that it's something that you learn through your interactions with your relatives. Think about that question Hold it in mind because later in the course, it's going to come back up again. Sociologists are interested in all aspects of society. In other words, we're talking about a group of people who shape their lives in pattern ways that distinguish their groups from other groups. Sociology looks at, and you'll hear this word a lot in the course of the study, institutions. There are many different institutions that we consider in sociology, like education, economics, politics, many other areas that are a part of that. Religion and family are other examples of institutions. Institutions are structures that make up our society, and structures might be different in other societies. For example, in places where education isn't available for all children, the structure of education in those societies would be much different where it is available for all. When we talk about sociology, one of the things that is an outcome of this course that we hope you will grasp is a sociological perspective or a way of looking at the world through sociological lens. There are some approaches that sociologists have developed for having a sociological perspective. These are beginner's mind, culture shock, and sociological imagination. And we'll cover these approaches now. The beginner's mind is just what it sounds like. It's the opposite of the expert's mind. Bernard McGrain was the one who basically Borrowing from Zen Buddhist tradition, believed that true learning occurs when we quiet our own mental chatter and then we can see things in a new way. If you take an opportunity, for example, to be in a place where you just observe people without commenting and working very hard to approach it as you are in that public space for the first time, just watching interactions among people, then you begin to grasp what beginner's mind is all about. Culture shock. 
it's a very common experience for people when they travel abroad. It's a sense of disorientation that you experience upon entering a new environment. But culture shock isn't just limited to traveling abroad. Culture shock can happen right here, right where you are. Because when we look at behaviors that are typical in one society or culture, they can be strange in another. For example, you might move from another part of the country to say you're coming from a small town and you move to the big city. And some of your mannerisms that you gain in small towns like saying hello to strangers might surprise people that you encounter in the big city. You see that they don't do those things there. Or you might find that doing something as common as trying to hail a cab might become a task that's quite unfamiliar and can cause stress or strain because of that. There are other ways in which we have culture shock. Graduating from high school or college or soldiers who are returning from war, leaving active duty altogether. Even people who retire having worked for a very long period of time and now are leading lives without having to go to work every day can experience culture shock. It's something that many of us are quite familiar with. The third element that sociologists use to develop a sociological perspective is what's called the sociological imagination. It's a term that C. Wright Mills coined and it's basically when we can understand the intersection between biography and history, then we are able to understand social life. It might seem a bit abstract and not always easy to understand, but if you were to imagine drawing a timeline that contained the last 100 years of history and you go through that timeline and you mark important parts along that timeline, putting a hash mark there. Things maybe such as the Industrial Revolution, the Civil Rights Movement, the anti-war movements and all of those things. And then at some point along that timeline is where you're born. And now your biography and your history intersects with the timeline. And that then helps determine things that you are familiar or not familiar with. And then you might also ask yourself how your life might have been different if you were born at a different time in history. What kinds of things might you have experienced? What kinds of things might you know or not know had you been born in a particular time? But that's the sociological imagination. Being able to see how our biography, our, our own personal history intersects with the larger aspect of history. Sociologists examine society and institutions on a variety of levels. They use that to explore social relationships. Microsociology looks at small group interactions to see how they impact larger institutions in society. A microsociological analysis might look at the relationship between a couple or the interactions of a sports team or even this short interaction between a cashier and a, and a shopper. A macro sociological analysis, on the other hand, might look at the economy and how it impacts consumer behavior or how a presidential election influences American morale because it examines the large scale social structures to see how they impact both groups and individuals. And this is looking at the wide variety of topics that sociology examines and the level of analysis all the way from the broad definition of society down to the self. Your book mentions the poem about the blind men and the elephant. And the purpose of it is to suggest that there are different ways of approaching or looking at a specific topic. And while some people 
Even sociologists may disagree about which way is the best. There are times when considering many different perspectives or theories will lead to the best understanding of the topic. So we're gonna look at some of the sociological theories now. Theories are in sociology of propositions that seek to explain the social world and to help make predictions about future events. We also look at them or refer to them as approaches, schools of thoughts, paradigms or perspectives. And sociological theories typically address social processes at either, as we talked about just a moment ago, micro sociological or macro sociological levels. Your book refers to paradigms or schools of thought, and they're like theoretical umbrellas. And we know that those terms are used interchangeably. And so as you take a little time, think about these for a moment as we move through them. First school of thought is structural functionalism. And the key word is function, that according to this theory, everything in our society has a function. The main principles of the functionalist paradigm are this, that society is stable, ordered system of interrelated parts or structures. Each structure has a function that contributes to the continued stability or equilibrium of the whole. Conflict theory proposes that conflict and tension are basic facts of social life and suggests that people have disagreements over goals and values and that they're involved in struggles over both resources and power. Whenever you see an analysis that looks at power and inequalities, you're dealing with conflict theory. It focuses on processes of dominance, competition, upheaval, and social change. The main emphasis of conflict theory are a materialist, materialist view of society that's focused on labor practices and economic reality and a critical stance toward existing social arrangements and a dynamic model of historical change in which the transformation of society is inevitable. Symbolic interaction is a unique contribution to sociology that has come from America. And it sees interaction and meaning as central to society and assumes that meanings aren't inherent, but rather created through interaction. And it's proved to be the most influential perspective of the 20th century. For symbolic interactionists, society is produced and reproduced through our interactions with each other by means of language and our interpretations of that language. Symbolic interaction sees face-to-face -face interaction as the building block of everything else in society because it's through that inter interaction that we create a social reality, a meaningful social reality. Here are the basic tenets of symbolic interaction. We act toward things on the basis of their meaning. For example, a tree can provide a shady place to rest or it can be an obstacle to building a road or a home. Each of these meanings suggests a different set of actions and this is true as true for physical objects like trees as it is for people like mothers or police officers, institutions such as church or school, beliefs such as honesty or equality, or any social activity. Meanings are not inherent, rather they are negotiated through interaction which, with others. That is, whether the tree is an obstacle or an oasis is not an intrinsic quality of the tree itself, but rather something people must determine. The same tree can mean one thing to one person and something else to another. Meanings can be 
changed or modified through interaction. For example, the contractor who sees the tree as an obstacle might be persuaded to spare it by the neighbor. Now the tree is something to build around rather than bulldoze. Although symbolic interaction is focused on how both self and society develop through interaction with others, it is useful in explaining and analyzing a wide variety of specific social issues from inequalities of race and gender to the dynamic group dynamics of families or co-workers. Feminist theory. There's a link between feminist theory and conflict theory and that both deal with stratification and inequality in society and both seek not only to understand that inequality, but to also provide remedies for it. But feminist theory looks at both gender inequalities in society and the ways that gender structures the social world and considers the remedies to these inequalities. Queer theory, which arose in the late 1980s and early 1990s, proposes that the categories of sexuality, such as homo, hetero, bi, and trans, are social constructs. In other words, no sexual category is fundamentally deviant or normal. We create these meanings socially, which means we can create, change those meanings as well. Queer theory was inspired by the gay and lesbian rights movements of the 1970s and the 1980s. Postmodernist theory is the last, and as I should say, of some of the new theoretical approaches. It suggests that social reality is diverse, pluralistic, and constantly changing. In order to understand postmodernism, we need to juxtapose it with modernism, the movement against which it was a reaction. Modernism is both a historical period and an ideological stance that began with the 18th century enlightenment or the age of reason. Modernist thought values scientific knowledge, a linear or timelike view of history, and a belief in the universality of human nature. In postmodernism, on the other hand, there are no absolutes, no claims to truth, reason, right, order, or stability. Everything is therefore relative, fragmented, temporary, and contingent. 